morning. Good morning. Welcome to our time of worship and praise. We'll begin our worship this morning with our first hymn, hymn 402, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3. Present 
and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Take heart. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Congregation, may be seated. <clears throat> now join in the responsive reading of our psalm for the day, Psalms 133 and 134, as printed on the screen. We begin. Happy the people the Lord has chosen to be his own. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even my life forevermore. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. Who in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from God. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now and will be forever. Amen. We pray. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift of grace that we come into your presence and offer our true and faithful service. Grant that our worship on earth may always be pleasing to you, and in the life to come, give us the fulfillment of what you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture lesson for today is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 56, beginning with the first verse. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand, and my righteousness will soon be revealed. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mouth and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted at my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Sovereign Lord declares, He who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson is from the letter of Paul to the Romans in chapter 11, beginning with verse 13. I am talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry, in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For their rejection brought reconciliation to the world. What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as the election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that 
they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. This is the word of the Lord. We'll now continue with our next hymn, hymn 403. I know my faith is founded. We sing verses 1 and 2. Send her away. 
for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that very moment. This is God's word. In the name of our gracious Savior, Jesus Christ, your fellow redeemed. This is the time of year when many people get together to draft their fantasy football teams. They make calculated picks for the best players they want to win. That kind of how we pick teams when we were in grade school. Captains pick either the best players or their, their best friends. And if you were like me, you were sitting there hoping you didn't get picked last. Because if you were picked last, that meant nobody really wanted you. That's how we pick teams. Can you imagine if Jesus picked like that? And yet, when we listen to Jesus' words as he spoke to that Canaanite woman, it does kind of seem like Jesus is saying that she was not on his team and he wasn't going to give up any of his good draft picks for this outsider. Although we make picks based on value, God picks differently. God picks people in a way that is true to his word. He doesn't pick people because he needs them or because they deserve to be picked, or because he, he wants friends. No, he picks us simply because he wants us on his team. He picks us because he wants us to share in his eternal glory. Let's go back to the story. Jesus is walking with his disciples, but not in in Jewish territory. They were up north on the west coast near the Mediterranean Sea. And a Canaanite woman, a local resident, comes to Jesus crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. And how does Jesus respond? He says nothing. Not even an acknowledgement whatsoever. We might think, what's going on? I mean, why would the Savior of the world ignore this request for help? The woman kept on making pleas for help, so much so that Jesus' disciples finally said, send her away. For she keeps crying out after us. When Jesus answered, rather than his words more directed to his disciples, his words were in a sense directed towards that woman. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Again, we might think, wait a minute. I mean, is Jesus really ignoring this woman? I thought he was the savior of the world. But this woman, instead of becoming discouraged, rather she becomes more persistent. She falls on her knees before Jesus, pleading, Lord, help me. And his answer, it's not right to take the children's breath 
and toss it to their dog. Why won't Jesus help this woman? Is she really that insignificant, that lowly, that Jesus viewed her as nothing more than a dog? Surprisingly, though, the woman agrees with what Jesus says. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Why would she accept such a, a lowly position? Why was she okay with just being a, an afterthought to Jesus? All of a sudden, you say the, the winds shift. Jesus says to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Jesus had been giving all these signs that he had absolutely no interest in helping this woman because she was not an Israelite. And then suddenly, he praises her faith and grants her request. Does God play favorites? Does he love or value some people more than others? It kind of seems like that's what Jesus was doing here with this Canaanite woman. See, but the, the whole idea of, of Jesus playing favorites goes against everything we know about God. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, God does not show favoritism. So, what's up with the way that Jesus treated this Canaanite woman? Well, God's plan of salvation all along was for the Messiah to go first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. That was a plan he announced to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A plan that he further revealed and reinforced through the prophets. He would preach first to the Jews, and then the gospel would be carried to the Gentiles, specifically to men like Peter and Paul. Maybe that's why Jesus did not answer the Canaanite woman right away. So as to make clear his mission. See, Jesus did spend the majority of his ministry among the Jews. Wouldn't be until after his resurrection, that he would commission his apostles to go and make disciples of all nations, that he would give them direct, pointed instructions to, to reach out and minister to all people, Jews and Gentiles included. See, this was God's plan of salvation, a plan, though, that was for all people. Out of all the nations in the world, God chose the Israelites to be the bearers of his name, the receivers of his promises, to be the people from whom the promised Messiah would come. And he chose them not because they were better than anybody else, not because they were more deserving, but out of his love. See, and that means that for us, no matter what order God picks us in, how it comes about, the important thing is that we are part of God's team. <clears throat> That's what Jesus was saying to that woman, and that she understood when Jesus told her it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. He was not insulting her or devaluing her. 
Jesus was emphasizing the promise that as the Messiah, as the son of David, he was to go first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. Yes, as the Savior of all people. That woman understood that it would not be right for her to, to ask Jesus to change the plans of his ministry just for her. She knew that Jesus was going to be a blessing for both Jews and Gentiles because he was the Savior of the whole world. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crops that fall from their master's table. She accepted her place and asked for the blessings that the Lord intended to give her. In a sense, she was saying, yeah, give me the scraps because they are enough. All I need is that little bit of grace to know that, that my daughter, who's suffering terribly from demon possession, will be cured. Does it matter if I'm the last one you pick, the last one you think of? Because I know that still you were sent for me. And even if I have to wait for the leftovers, you picked me and my daughter to be a part of your victory over sin, death, and the devil. That's why Jesus prays her faith. She understood that, yes, while Jesus came first for the Jews and then for the Gentiles, that he cared for all people and was the savior of all people. Whether they received the first portions or just crumbs that fell to the floor. She understood that anyone who's a part of Jesus' team would be taken care of and have all their needs met, including the final victory over all evil. That faith of that Canaanite woman, a faith that placed total confidence in Jesus, is a faith that is worth emulating. Christ came indeed, according to his plans, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, but he came to be a blessing for all. And so, you and I, we might not be superstars in the Christian church here on earth, the best the church has to offer, but God has chosen us. And while we don't boast about ourselves, in the order that we were picked in, no, rather, we boast about the one who picked us. We are part of his team. And we share in his victory, just like that Canaanite woman. Amen. And may that peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, let us join in confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles. <coughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation, please. Let me. 
me live, that I may praise you and may the cross sustain me. May the grace of the Lord Jesus sanctify us and keep us from all evil. May Christ drive all hurtful things far from us and purify both our souls and bodies. And may Christ bind us to himself by the bond of love and may his peace abound in our hearts. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We conclude our worship with hymn 326. May the grace of Christ our Savior. We sing verses 1, 2, and 3.
like every Tuesday during the school year, he's leading a Bible study at the college coffee shop. While the setting is informal, the value of gatherings like this is enormous, offering a lifeline to young people who are away from their home church for the very first time. Looking at the opportunity to, to, to do this Bible study is going great. That's why I find it very important to, you know, to, to meet like this, because if your faith, if you're not, you know, taking the time to kind of build it, it's going to wither. I think having other people around, knowing that they're going through the same things that I'm going through, is definitely a big thing, and that I'm not alone. College students often have lots of challenges in life and in their faith. That's why it's especially important we serve them in these critical years. They come with challenging questions at times too, which makes me better as a pastor, makes our congregation better, because it causes us to dig into the Word and, and ask questions, um, go into the proper source. We cover just such depth of um, like really diving into it and trying to understand like some of the really difficult things about salvation and scripture and I like that side of it. Those challenges against my faith have actually grown my faith, have allowed me to um, be even more confident in the salvation I have through Christ. Weekly informal Bible studies are just one of many ways churches can connect to students through campus ministry. Maintaining my faith for college wasn't going to be something that I can do alone. It was something that I was going to need help with, it was something that I was going to need encouragement with, and it's just more fun when you're doing it with people. To help congregations get started, Wells is now offering a Canvas Ministry Toolkit with ideas and templates to help churches take the first steps in Canvas Ministry. In addition to the new toolkit, the Wells Canvas Ministry Committee offers a range of valuable materials to help congregations get started. Even if you don't have a college nearby, there's no shortage of ways you can participate to bring Christ Jesus to students on campuses. Visit wells.net for ideas and resources.